Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Miguel Gueldron Ramirez, assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Oregon. His research interests include critical philosophy of race, Latin American and Caribbean philosophy, aesthetics and philosophy of art, 18th and 19th century German philosophy, and 20th century continental philosophy. Gueldron Ramirez studied philosophy as an undergrad and an MA student at the Universidad Nacional de Colombia and earned a PhD in philosophy from DePaul University in Chicago. Before joining UO, he was an assistant professor in the philosophy and religion department at the University of North Texas and visiting professor of philosophy at Oxford College of Emory. Welcome to you all. Thanks Thank you. for coming on the show, and, and um, it's great to have you with us. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. So first, Miguel, tell us about your background and how you became a philosopher. Oof, that's a complicated question. Um, I started studying economics. I, I graduated from high school too young, I think, and I wasn't <laughs> Don't sure. Don't we all graduate from <laughs> high school too young? Maybe, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Um, I felt too young and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. I started studying economics and that wasn't for me. Um, I was struggling with classes and I'm really not good at math and apparently that's an important thing uh, <laughs> for economics. Um, but I, I discovered that what I really liked was uh, the theory classes, the classes on you know, the history of the thought on this, uh, reading Marx and Adam Smith and all these people, and also theories of value. Um, um, so I started more and more thinking that perhaps what I wanted to do was a more philosophical kind of approach to economics or other things. And I slowly migrated to taking classes in the philosophy department, um, which was great for me. Um, I remember my first philosophy class was on Plato. I just sat there for an hour the first time, and I realized, you know, like a magical, <laughs> Uh, falling in love, you know, at first sight. Um, and I've been doing that all over um, these years. Um, yeah, so I started in Colombia, uh, grew up in Colombia and started philosophy in Colombia uh, through a very um, traditional education, uh, focused mostly on European thought, mm -hmm. um, both analytic and continental. Um, and I, when I came to the United States to do my PhD, I discovered um, almost like a paradox. I had to go away uh, from Colombia, from Latin America, to really start thinking about. Um, and I have been thinking about that movement uh, ever since, what it is to think about a place when you're not in that place, mm -hmm. Latin America and the Caribbean, um, and what it is to refer to some of the thought and authors that are important in our tradition from the United States, uh, and from US academia, uh, and that's a question that it's going in my head all the time, still yeah. today. Um, so I mentioned that you're an expert in the critical philosophy of race. So how do you define that? Um, if, we, if we understand the world and the history of the world, the world that we have today, as having been constructed um, around axes of race and gender, uh, among many other things perhaps, it's not that we can reduce everything that we are to those categories, but those categories determine what, who we are and what place we occupy in society. Mm -hmm. A critical philosophy of race is an analysis and a, trying to come up with ways in which we can understand those racial constructions, uh, the world and society as it is, as affected, organized around questions of race, among other things. Um, critical philosophy of race also tends to be interested in the intersections of race with um, gender, sexuality, class, um, and uh, attempts to offer a critical analysis through these different lenses and this organization of thought. And lastly, I would say uh, uh, critical philosophy of race is interested in transformation. Um, mm -hmm. It's not only interested in diagnosing and um, presenting, um, but also in transforming and finding ways in which we can resist and transform a society that it that has constructed around race is also constructed around racism and sexism. Um, so what it is to transform those things, um, and this is mostly what I what I approach in my thought and in my work. So, I think there's a commonsensical understanding of philosophers that they just think about stuff, mm -hmm. that 
the last thing that you talked about, that there's a, um, a kind of political aim. Is that a particular, particularly unique to decolonial philosophy, critical race philosophy? Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's unique. Uh, it's perhaps something that we take very seriously and we want to think with. But there are many traditions in philosophy that are interested in this from very different perspectives. Um, critical phenomenology, for example, feminism, um, disability studies, um, things that are not necessarily immediately dealing with um, questions of coloniality, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily from the Americas, for example, and yet they aim at this form of transformation. Um, I think um, that division that we do in our, in our discipline between theory and practice and how many times philosophers have thought whatever that has a, an application or a practical side is not immediately philosophy, it's using philosophy to apply to another discipline. I think that's, that might have been the history of philosophy or Western philosophy, but that's something that we have to transform and that we have to think in different ways. And many times theory itself is transformational in ways that are not necessarily the ways in which we think of activism or mm -hmm. uh, social movements. Um, theory is capable of altering the world. Um, Bell Hooks, a uh, uh, US American philosopher uh, who died recently, um, has this very passionate and interest defense of theory. Um, and theory as something that changed the life of, of the person who was writing these things and perhaps can change the life of students too. So not only is theory transformational sometimes, but also we have to think of ways in which we, we use these concepts and attempt to put them back in reality and in a social reality. So you just mentioned bell hooks, and I want to take you to the topic of your dissertation, your doctoral mm -hmm. dissertation, Glissant. Mm -hmm. So this is also a, uh, a, a philosopher who has a similar view. So it's, first of all, tell us um, who was he, and then tell us why you were drawn to him and, and how his thought has influenced you. Yeah, um, so Edouard Glisson is a, was a Martinican um, thinker, writer, theorist, uh, many things, um, activist, um, who is first of all very difficult to categorize as a philosopher, writer, etc. Uh, his thought has been, his writing has been analyzed mostly from a literary perspective. He was um, in the run for the Nobel Prize of Literature and is an accomplished poet and recognized in many ways, but his essays are less read as essays uh, from f places like philosophy. Uh, and that has been changing a little bit. Um, I encountered Glissant in my first quarter at the Paul uh, with a very dear professor of mine, uh, Daryl Moore, uh, who included uh, one of his books, Poetics of Relation, in a class that was Glissant, Fanon, and Foucault. Like very interesting, <laughs> strange kind of connections that made total sense for me at the time. And I just read Poetics of Relation and couldn't stop thinking about it. Uh, I came to the poll to do um, German Romanticism and Hegel and Nietzsche, and I ended up you know, writing my dissertation on Glissant, I think mediated by this very profound experience. Um, I, I like from Glissant, he helps me think a thought that is grounded and specific to a, to a place and that is yet not exclusive or identitarian or only aimed at uh, the people in the Caribbean, um, but actually can think the whole world in ways that are, I find interesting still. I really like also his commitment to a multi-regional thought. He was in dialogue with French literature and philosophy, German philosophy, but also obviously thinking from and with the Caribbean in ways in which I had never encountered before due to my own ignorance. Um, and a bit of uh, conservative education too. Um, so he transformed the ways in which I look at, and I see questions that I had already, questions of aesthetics, of politics, of history. Um, and yeah, I ended up writing, writing my whole dissertation on, on Glissant exclusively. So he, obviously he's Caribbean. One of your areas of expertise is Caribbean and Latin American philosophy. And I'm interested in that you 
at least in your bio, those those categories go together. Yes. So say why they go together and what's what's similar, what brings Caribbean and Latin American philosophy together. Yeah, um, that's something that I that I aim that I that that is at the center of, of my my thought and my in my work. Um, I I think that division, the artificial division between the Caribbean and Latin America and U.S. or North America. Um, is detrimental to ways in which we can think of the joint and collective history of the construction of the continent, um, what it was perhaps before the arrival of uh, European uh, colonizers, but also afterwards, how it was constructed as something that is thought of both by indigenous peoples in many ways and by, and by the cultures that we have today along with them as expansive um, as a, a project, a continental project. Um, and that artificial division between languages, between regions, between histories that colonialism did is detrimental to ways in which we can understand that. And I really, uh, I find it very um, sad that in, 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 in academia and you know, in our disciplines, we maintain that distinction. We are either Caribbean scholars or interested in Caribbean history, uh, or languages, uh, or Latin American. And we Latin American people maintain in many ways this. We feel very close to you know, the people in the continent, even as far as you know, Mexico, Chile, there is sort of like a pan uh, 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 regional kind of identity and, pr and pride, and we know very little about the Caribbean um, and how it has determined what we are in our history, but also the histories of rebellions and resistance and transformation that are so um, present in the Caribbean that, that we don't understand completely. So what I, what I do, part of what I do in, in my work and in my classes in particular is trying to teach and think about ways in which we can create uh, dialogues and conversations and think of these histories as joined, not the same, different obviously, but joined in both um, oppression and resistance. Um, and I think Lisan allows for, for something like that, thinking from the Caribbean definitely, but interested in an expansion of this to the rest, the rest of the continent. Fascinating, really interesting. So your first book project, uh, Decolonial Aesthetics, Theory and Praxis uh, from the Americas, is under contract with Indiana University Press. So can you give us a, like an overview of the project of that, that book? Yeah, uh, the idea of the book is that we will gain, we could gain a lot of insight and understanding and ways of responding to coloniality if we locate our thought and our consideration of coloniality at the aesthetic level. Um, the aesthetic level is not the only level that is affected by coloniality. Scholars talk about a coloniality of language, of being, of sexuality, of gender, um, uh, political systems, knowledge. And I want to add to that category, or those, those categories, aesthetics. Um, this is following the thought of many people who have been thinking about this in these terms. Um, I'm thinking Maria del Rosario Costa, Alejandro Vallega, um, Mariana Ortega, and many, many others who um, are trying to locate the, the level of our approach to coloniality at the aesthetic level. Um, both in ways in which this has been constructed as, a, as an oppressive regime, but also ways in which we can understand and resist. Um, aesthetics is understood in that project as a uh, level of the analysis that has to do with sense and perception and emotion. Um, one example of this is aesthetic experiences that have to do with art, both in participating, contemplating, receiving art, but also ways in which the doing, the, the creation of art transforms ways in which we see ourselves and others. But art is not the only example of this, of this perception uh, and sense level that I aim at in the book. Um, uh, so in the book I analyze um, uh, understandings of identity, self-identity, the question of beauty, um, as a decolonial question, silence, um, opacity, um, and different forms of art, as long, uh, along with um, um, political movements, social movements, resistance, etc., that configure an aesthetic level that help us understand how our political war and social war has been constructed around coloniality, but also how we can 
resist and understand it. In so a you way. mentioned some philosophers who are also interested in decolonial aesthetics. Does this book project also analyze works of art, creative works? Yes, yes. An important part of the book is um, um, centered around experiences of art and works of art in paintings, um, film, um, theater um, are, are some of those. Uh, I'm currently working and, and writing about a Cuban printmaker, um, Belki Sayon, um, that had a solo Massive show here, yeah. here a ago. couple of years ago that I missed. Amazing uh, show. Yeah, sure. um, and I want to, I'm writing about her conception of identity. She has a, a very specific character that appears in many of her works, uh, who is a woman who is part and not part of the history of this very secret society in Cuba, religious and mystical society. Um, so how this character, uh, Zikan, and, and, and people around this, um, this, this interpretation of life um, s are able to see themselves um, through what I see in her work as a very opaque presentation of those characters. Many of the characters are almost faceless. We see maybe their eyes and their mouth. Uh, so it's a very plain, opaque kind of approach to them. And yet I see a lot of expressivity, uh, a lot of um, movement and passion and dealing with questions of identity. Uh, so through her work and her art, I see a way in which we can configure some realms of resistance to this construction of identities yeah. on the continent. Mm -hmm. cool. um, so you're also writing another book, or you have this other book project, which is on um, anti-blackness in Latin American thought. So tell us a little bit about that idea. Yes, um, I've noticed as a, in many ways a newcomer to uh, Latin American philosophy and, and, and the tradition of thought, um, that in the United States, it seems that one of the ways in which we tend to diversify academia and, and philosophy, perhaps this is what I'm most uh, familiar with, is by introducing other traditions of thought uh, and including them in philosophy departments, along with a Western uh, approach to philosophy or Western European philosophy. Um, and that seems to be enough. So we hire Latin American scholars or Asian scholars or African scholars who present and teach classes on the history of this thought and that seems to be enough. And I grew and um, you know, reading and, and, and teaching along these years uh, classes on Latin American thought, it is very difficult for me to follow this tradition without seeing it as harmful and reproducing um, the things that we criticize from, from European thought, racism and sexism, in ways in which we just appropriate as Latin American, but maintain in many ways. So many times when we diversified philosophy departments by including Latin American scholars, or scholars of Latin American thought, uh, we are not necessarily doing a service to the transformation of philosophy because we're maintaining with other names, with Latin American sounding uh, last names, um, similar ideas and similar thoughts. So one of the things that I think it's maintaining this history is um, racism and anti-blackness in particular. Um, how from Bolivar to Vasconcelos, uh, and many others, we still construct identity, Latin American identity on the basis of an extraction and a use of black bodies and labor and um, uh, lives, um, but also an erasure of that from our identities. Mestizaje is one example of this, this ideology of mestizaje that we are all mixed in Latin America. The idea of the cosmic race in Vasconcelos is one example of this um, that, you know, denies the fact that not only we are not one race, uh, but also our societies are still constructed, as in many other places in the world, upon a hierarchy of who is worthy of, you know, value and knowledge and uh, beauty, and who is not, and whose lives are matter and whose lives do not. Um, so my book analyzes some instances of this anti-blackness and the perpetuation of this under the guise of, you know, liberatory and and resistance forms of philosophy, but also analyzes ways in which um, people in the continent have responded to this history uh, from philosophy or from philosophical considerations that I think still 
offer, offer a way, open a way for us to understand Latin American philosophy and a tradition intervened. So it's not about abandoning the possibility of a Latin American and Caribbean philosophy, but perhaps transforming it through these lenses. So you've mentioned repeatedly terms like transformation, and it seems clear to me that one of your commitments as a philosopher is the transformation of the discipline of philosophy, the practice of the discipline and the construction of the discipline, and particularly academic institutionalization of the discipline. Can we say a little bit more about that, why that's important? Um, yes. Um, um, when I started teaching uh, philosophy at an introductory level, introduction to philosophy or ethics, um, I saw constantly uh, philosophy is philosophy is this way of thinking or this tradition of thinking that I think everyone is capable of feel in their bodies as something that they have thought of, that, that they have done their own reflections of who we are, what we are, why are we here in the world, what is freedom. Um, so, so many of the students had these questions already and were dealing with these questions uh, and were very excited to come uh, to philosophy. And then many of them were highly and very quickly disappointed at the, at the discipline, not in a necessarily in a conscious way, mm -hmm. philosophy sucks, I don't want to do this anymore, mm -hmm. but something like, and I heard this from many of them, this is not for me. Um, I thought this was for me, but this is not for me. So I think, what is it about philosophy that is not for you? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not that you are not intelligent enough, it's not that you're not capable enough, maybe there's something about the discipline that we're reading that is not for you. Um, and one of the things I think happens is that many students in, here in the United States who come from not traditionally represented backgrounds in philosophy do not see themselves as capable of doing this kind of thing, or this mm -hmm. is for someone else. Um, and um, being unable to see themselves in the, in the tradition has to do with what this tradition does, how it's presented, but also the kinds of questions that are represented here. So how can I fall in love with philosophy if someone like Aristotle or Kant or Hegel or I mean, these important figures, um, uh, John Locke, um, exclude from the possibility of doing philosophy these very same bodies that are interested in it? This is not trivial. This is not something that we can just say, yeah, um, 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 I don't know, Kant was obviously part of his context and, you know, misguided in many ways, but we can still have a Kantian philosophy without the racist part, or we can we can translate it into today's world. I don't think this is that easy. I don't think we can just do that. I think we can still, and we should still read Kant, but we have to find ways in which this can be criticized, um, not as a mistake, not as an overlook, not as a problem of the context, but something that is at the root of the philosophy itself. Um, and we can only do that if we read other people, um, not only read Kant and you know, point to the passages that we want to avoid uh, or that we wish he hadn't written, but also read other people who are thinking with Kant and, and who are replying to him, but also who are thinking other questions, uh, questions that Kant had no possibility of understanding. The question of freedom is fundamental for Kant, I'm just using Kant as an example. Mm -hmm. um, um, but what we understand by freedom is mediated by experiences today that he didn't think of and that he couldn't perhaps. Um, questions of slavery in the Americas, questions of a plantation system that expanded its branches all over the world as an experiment that was made in a way, created here. Uh, questions of revolution, uh, the Haitian revolution, for example, as you know, figuring out ways in which we can maintain ideals of the Enlightenment uh, that Kant had very much thought of and, and defended in his writings, and yet used them for the purpose of liberating people who were oppressed in this particular way. Um, so transforming the discipline is reading other people, is thinking about questions that are not, that are new questions, relatively new. Um, but I also think it's a matter of transforming the form, not only the content of what we do, but the form. And this is something that I try to do in my classes as much as possible. Challenge the hierarchy of professor and students, um, uh, doctor and undergrad, um, transforming the dynamics of 
listening to a person lecture for hours, telling them what it is. And perhaps beginning with questions that the students themselves have. Um, I think also the discipline is transformed when we tell students that um, everyone is responsible for the education process, not only the professor. That in the classroom where things don't go well, is not only because the professor is boring or is not that clear or the texts are difficult, but perhaps the students have something to do with that as well. Um, and that attempt, I think, includes all this, of these layers, and that's something that I'm doing and still grappling with every, almost every day. So I want to ask you more about teaching, but, but I want to have one follow-up on this question of form. So when you said it also entails a kind of transformation of form, you started talking about institutional forms. What about the form of the text itself? I mean, one of the critiques of philosophy is that the form of it is elitist. That yes. It's not just that students don't recognize their experience, their backgrounds, their bodies, but that they can't literally understand the style in which it's written. What do you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And that's a question that many the colonial philosophers still like struggle with. Uh, the colonial philosophy written and liberation philosophy written in a way that is, you know, for very few. Uh, and who, if not the people who are like the, 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 the affected by this should be able to read this and understand it so that they can do something with it. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this question all the time. I think one way we, we can transform that form of the text is by having students um, involved in the process of thinking about topics and questions not necessarily only mediated by text, but mm -hmm. by themselves. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to abandon the text and the difficult text either. Um, you know, following uh, questions of philosophy of education and, 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 and things that I've read in, in Paulo Freire and Jacques Rancière, uh, there is something about that capacity that we all have, um, that it's a universal capacity to the point that, yes, it's difficult, and yes, you're not going to get it the first, the second, the third time, but if you're really interested in this, you can sit down and end up reading all these very difficult texts and doing something with this. Um, at least, you know, in a, in a privileged setting, an institution like the university, where at least you have the time, weekly time, to devote to something like this. So I, I want to intervene in the text and delocate sources of philosophy to other places other, other than the text, but I don't want to abandon the difficulty and the challenge of texts that are very rich and important. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, tell me about a, a single course. What, what, what have you recently taught? You've already taught something, told us something about the way you approach teaching, but tell us about a course, a specific course. Um, uh, uh, a year ago, a couple of years ago, I taught a class called Anti-Racist Thought um, that I organized around the idea of abolition. Um, so we did um, an, an analysis and understanding of, of coloniality and you know, racist and sexist structures um, and, and class of society that organize the world that we have today. And that world is organized around um, racist, uh, uh, many other things of course, but racist hierarchies of thought. Um, so an anti-racist philosophy or thought has to deal with, has to do both with the diagnosis of that society but also with ways in which we can intervene in that society. And one, one way in which we can do that, and think people are thinking about this today, is the lens of abolition. Um, prison abolition, police abolition, um, 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 and capitalism, um, and, and um, abolition in general. Um, so around these questions, I think we read a lot of very theoretical and very practical and mix both of uh, approaches to these questions. Um, and we analyze a lot of practical uh, examples of abolitionist and abolitionist institutions and peoples and thought. So my last question, what attracted you to the University of Oregon? Um, I was, I was um, interested in the philosophy department at Oregon uh, ever since I was a grad student. Um, I, I had friends who came here, who studied here, and I always thought that what the people in the philosophy department did was really interesting. It's a very interesting pluralistic department that I have not seen in other places, um, certainly not in the US. Um, and that pluralism, I think it's something that I'm learning from um, uh, almost every day here, from my colleagues, but also from students. Um, so I, I was 
interested in participating in that different way of doing philosophy um, and also the particular focus that we are having here in Latin American and decolonial philosophy. Well, Miguel, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I want to take your classes. <laughs> We're lucky to have you. It's been great uh, having you. this conversation. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, it was a great conversation. And uh, send me an email. I, I'm happy to have you in one of my classes, <laughs> definitely. I've been speaking with Miguel Galdron, Galdron Ramirez, Assistant Professor of Philosophy at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching.